All right, good evening and welcome to our Spotlight Talk series. Uh, my name is Moira Anderson and I am a part of our public programs team here at Crystal Bridges. It's an honor to welcome you all virtually for this conversation between artists Ben Benham and Evan Preco. Whether you're joining us here over Zoom or tuning in through Facebook, we're just thrilled to have this opportunity to bring a talk to an audience from all over the country. Um, and I want to mention, of course, this opportunity wouldn't be possible without the generous sponsors of the Spotlight Talk series. Um, a thank you to Del Monte Foods Incorporated and to your Gold Price Club. Uh, we thank you for your continued uh, sponsorship of our Spotlight Talk lecture series. You can continue to meet us here on Zoom for more lectures in our Spotlight Talk as we continue to feature artists included in the Crafting um, America exhibition in the coming months. All that information about each speaker is up on our website, including the exact dates and times. Um, and we'd love for you to share this information out to uh, your friends and families. I don't think that anybody should uh, miss out on any of these conversations. For tonight, um, sharing a few housekeeping notes. If you wanna take advantage of our live captioning in Zoom, we're providing this through the CC icon on the bar located on the bottom of your screen. Um, you can just simply click the button and select the option to turn them on. And we'll also be collecting your questions and comments throughout the talk using the Q&A button. Um, please send them in at any time during the conversation and we'll make sure to leave some time at the end to address them. In tonight's talk, uh, I'm, thrill I'm thrilled to welcome fiber artist Ben Benham. Uh, ben is best known for taking imagery from traditional craft arts and juxtaposing it with modern imagery that draws attention uh, to imagery found in vintage tattoos, the occult, punk rock, and motorcycle gangs. Ben graduated from the San Francisco Art Institute in 2007 with a Master of Fine Arts degree, and his work has been shown nationally and internationally, including the Levi Strauss Museum in Germany, the National Folk Museum in Korea, uh, the Greg Museum of Art and Design, and the Craft and Folk Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, most recently, he was the artist in residence at Mass Mocha and the DM Museum. Moderating the conversation this evening is the editor of Juxtapose Magazine uh, and another San Francisco-based individual, Evan Preco. Evan has been the editor of Juxtapose Magazine since 2006 and the author and editor of Juxtapose Book Series and the co-host of the Radio Juxtapose podcast. As a curator, he has worked with Takashi Murakami on Juxtapose at Superflat, with Roger Gassman on Touring Beyond the Street series, as well as the Juxtapose Clubhouse series and the Juxtapose at 25 in Black and White Exhibition. Ben, Evan, it's such a pleasure to welcome you this evening. Thanks. Thank you for that introduction. That was fantastic. You know, actually, it's this is, might be a good place to start, uh, Ben. I mean, I was just yep. thinking about this, that you were part of that Juxtapose X Superflat show that we did in Seattle and at the Vancouver Art Gallery in mm -hmm. Vancouver. And we talked about this a little bit off camera, but yeah, that's, that was five years ago. And it's crazy. Yeah. Which is crazy because it feels like last year didn't count. But totally. The, the appreciation and the attention that fiber arts, textile arts has, has received since even then. Because when, when we had you in that show, it felt like such, it was a kind of a big move. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit to, as we start, how have you seen the growth and the acceptance of this art form, of any sort of craft art form over the last couple of years? Like what, what is your perspective on like the, the attention that's, that's starting to come with, with what you do? Well, for me, it's like, I've been doing, working primarily in textile since like 2008. But uh, so I've kind of seen things grown a little bit over the years, but uh, more towards your point, it's like the last like maybe three or four years, it's really seen like a big uh, bump up and or I don't want to say resurgence necessarily, but like uh, a, a big interest in like in the crafting medium. And I think part of that has to do with, uh, you know, there's a variety of reasons, but there's definitely a, a you know, more than a few artists that are really pushing the medium in different ways that maybe we haven't seen before or, or more importantly, we haven't seen in a long time because, you know, craft, craft has been around for quite a long time and obviously quilt, you know, people have been making quilts for centuries. So it's necessarily not in anything new. It's just people are kind of putting a more modern spin to it. And I think that's kind of what's really uh, brought attention to 
the medium as of the last like couple years. I mean, just in the last three years, there's been um, like way more interest in it that I've seen. Like I've seen it in like a lot more museum exhibitions, gallery exhibitions, um, you know, even in, within like the fashion industry, et cetera. So it's, it's great to kind of see the medium in a, in a whole new light, um, modern day light. The gravitational pull of the digital world is basically has has sucked a lot of our attention. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like in the early twentieth century, as digital twenty first century, as more and more digital kind of uh, applications were given to us, there was also this movement of more craft, like mm -hmm. a resurgence of crafts uh, when it comes to fashion, when it came to food, when it came to um, even the way people kind of decorated their homes. Um, how, as a graduate of SFAI, what do you, what kind of drew you towards more of a craft practice? So when I was in grad school uh, at SFAI, I was doing a little bit of sewing already, but I was primarily doing screen printing. And then I kind of like started to merge the two a little bit more. And I got to a point within my artistic career where I didn't want to just do like a pretty picture that hung on the wall. Not that, there's any, not that there's anything wrong with that. Just for me personally, I want to do something that kind of could go beyond the gallery wall, go beyond the museum wall that, that had a, a distinct purpose in the world, a function. And so I was looking for a kind of a medium that could kind of incorporate all that, you know, co concept, aesthetic and, and function. And that's what ultimately led me to working with textiles. And so, and that's kind of, once I kind of hit that, Hit that mark i really didn't look back i just kind of dropped everything else more or less and just primarily started working with textiles i primarily doing quilts um, i had no idea what i was doing when i first started out um yes i i did go to grad school and, and got an mfa but that was just like a, a master of fine arts and there was no mm -hmm. no distinction or um a specific part of that degree which was great because uh, at sfai um the degree was really, you know, based around uh, concept. And so I didn't have like a, a specific discipline that I had to focus on. So I came out of that program, um, you know, more looking worth kind of like a concept based kind of mindset and then kind of trying to merge that with textiles. And again, back to this idea of functionality, but um, again, more toward the point of what I was saying about not knowing what I was doing. I, I literally had no idea how to make a quilt or or how to construct anything, you know, um, stitch in a ditch. None of that really made much sense to me. So I, I right. bought a book called Quilting Basics 101. And the reason why I bought that book is because it couldn't, I couldn't find anything that was more uh, elementary than that. <laughs> I mean, that's it, that's it. You're I, at right, right there. I, you can't go more base level than that. And one of the reasons I bought that book also is because it had a lot of photographs. <laughs> so I could, <laughs> I could like read it and be like, oh, that's what they mean. Oh, okay. But, um, and I, you know, when I teach, I always try to, you know, relay that, that to my students. The point being like, don't let any of your lack of ability or technical skill hinder you from, you know, taking your idea to fruition and seeing it to the end because ultimately you can learn these skills. Um, the idea reigns supreme always. That's the most important thing is your idea and concept. And you can kind of figure out everything else along the way. Um, and, um, I, and I'm still learning to this day, 100%. I still have a lot more to learn. I don't, I don't know, because you and I are just doing this conversation. I don't know if there's a slideshow going on where people can see like all of your work, um, but I want you to explain in the simplest terms, what is, there we go, what is a, what is a Ben Venom quilt? What are the characteristics of it that uniquely make it yours? So I would say uh, all of my quilts from a technical aspect are quilts. They have the uh, top layer, the batting, and a bottom layer. So they are technically, by definition, a quilt. All of mine are appliqued. Uh, pretty much all are applique, which means that I'm sewing a piece of fabric onto the top layer. I pretty much use like a, a satin stitch. It's uh, it's kind of like an embroidery stitch or a zigzag stitch. Uh, it's a satin stitch. But and the other another aspect that I would describe the work that's um, that I would say define my work is I 
I try to use as much as possible recycled or, or donated fabric that either is uh, from family, friends, general public, or stuff I might have to, you know, walk down to Goodwill and buy. Uh, so it's incorporating all different types of fabrics. And, and that's important to me, especially for friends and family or just people that don't even know that will literally, literally send me boxes of fabric. Because one way that I look at my work is it's not just mine, it's ours. So if you were to send me like a t-shirt of yours that you had worn, a piece of you is now in the work. So it's, again, it's not just mine, it's ours. You know, there's a history that you had when you wore that fabric that's now tied into this like greater collection of memories um, from everyone else that donated material to the work. So what I, what I like to say is it's everyone's unexplained stain, tear or rip is now on view in the form of a functional piece of artwork, typically a quilt or a jacket or a pillow or, you know, anything else. Now, uh, does that, that mindset fit into the tradition of quilting in general? where a quilt is, a quilt is it's, it's part of a collective. The collective part, yes. For instance, like the, the quilters of G's Ben would typically have, um, so they'd make the quilt and a lot of the quilts that they made were from uh, recycled or like material from uh, the community. So people would wear denim, like the denim quilts of G's Ben, those, the, the fabrics all kind of torn up because it was worn. And so they would, they would cut it up and reuse it. So this idea of like upcycle and reuse is extremely important. And it's extremely important to me also. And so that's why you kind of see that, that fabric being uh, a little torn up or, or, or beaten up a little bit. And then they would come together as a, so one, there's one person who's designing and making the quilt. And then at the very end, uh, a bunch of people uh, from the community would come together and do like the final stitch, like the quilt stitch which is the, the last, one of the last steps you do to make a quilt. And that's the stitch that holds all three layers together. And mm -hmm. mind you, they were, a lot of the quilts from G's Ben were done like hand quilted. So they're like hand stitching all this. Uh, I, I machine stitch all of mine. Um, I tend to like to make very large quilts. Like I think the largest one I've made to date is like 13 feet by 15 feet. And I don't, I do all the sewing entirely myself. So mm -hmm. I don't have a community that comes to assist me in the final stitch. That's just it's the not, things that are given to you by friends and by people. Exactly. My, the way that my work is uh, community based is, is the fact that everyone kind of donates to the found to, to the donates the fabric that becomes the foundation of the quilt. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of so, my collective community aspect to it. There's, there's so many directions we can go. And like, we've talked, you know, I've been lucky enough to interview before and, and there's so many things I want to touch on. And, and it's like, we could talk about the imagery that you're using, the subcultures that you're representing and what those cultures mean today and the growth of heavy metal and skateboard culture. And, but what I, what I kind of wanted to just to ask you a simple question first is what do you think makes your work essentially American? And do you think your work is essentially American? That's a good question. I've never been asked that question. I've never thought from like an yeah. American standpoint. Yes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know if I would really, I would argue that it's not necessarily um, uh, strictly American, even though I am an American. I, because, I, you know, I've shown my work all over. So I, I've always tried to position myself as just a person living, you know, like, a person, an artist that draws from all, all over, right? Like not just like Americana specifically, mm -hmm. even though more to your question, yeah, like this, maybe a lot of the imagery I'm using, um, I think you could argue is, is definitely uh, linked to more of a kind of an American mentality. Right. Um, I would agree with that. Like and the, uh, and skate, I know, skateboarding. And I know quilts, and I know quilts <laughs> every culture has, it has a certain relationship to quilt. <laughs> Um, but I, I was curious if you thought some of like the reimagining of the craft is something that you feel might be inherently American in, in your work at all. Well, maybe like maybe probably some of the, the fabrics that I'm using, like the t-shirts, like the heavy metal t-shirts, you know, I've done a lot of denim quilts and a lot of the, those quilts have different sayings on them, like turn up the light turn up the night, living on the razor's edge, no more tears. Like for instance, the no more tears quilt is, um, 
a reference to an Ozzy Osbourne lyric. You know, he's English, but um, the American link to it, you could argue, was that, you know, my sister and I grew up using Johnson & Johnson shampoo, which was No More Tears shampoo, right? So that's strictly a very an American shampoo, right? So there's your an American connection. Um, there's Jane Polly there. Uh, so American. Um, and I think then also, you know, punk rock, but even though know, punk rock didn't, it wasn't necessarily from America either, you know, you could link that back to Sex Pistols and, and whatnot. Right. So yeah. right. that, that, that's a good question, Evan. I'd, I'd like, I could probably, I'd have to think on it to come up with a better answer to you. But I think that the short answer to that was that I've never, ever really thought about just being an American quilter. Um, and I think that kind of goes back to when I moved out here into the Bay Area, like I, I live in San Francisco, but in the Bay Area, you know, I remember being told early on, like, don't be pinned as like only a Bay Area artist. You don't want to have that distinction because you just, you want to be more of a kind of an artist that lives in the world, right? You want to be a person of, that draws from all over and you don't want to necessarily be pegged as just this one little thing. Because I mean, you, you're, you well know this too, like the art world or just kind of any of these kind of different societies or cultures that we're a part of, but you know, especially the art world kind of want to pin you as like one thing, you're this and only this for the rest of mm -hmm. your career, right? And so I've always tried to like, not necessarily be categorized as just that. So for instance, when I describe myself as, I'm an artist that is predominantly working in the medium of textiles, right? So that's pretty general, but that's on purpose. I'm not just a quilter. I'm not just someone who makes, uh, you know, quilts to have heavy metal t-shirts. I'm not just something person that makes um, jackets from like a, from a pattern, you know, et cetera. Like I try to do this, this, and this, and that. Right. So, um, did, that, now, did that answer your question? No, it did. And I, it actually led, leads me to something else where you, you're based in San Francisco and you went to school in San Francisco. You've been here for a long time. And San Francisco is the birthplace of, um, I mean, it could arguably be uh, considered to be a birthplace of underground comics. It could right. be for the birthplace of psychedelic posters, two different kind of uh, art forms that came from something and sort of twisted it and turned a little, turned it rebellious. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think your career trajectory would have been different had you not been in San Francisco at that certain age that you were in the San Francisco? Oh, a thousand percent. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 totally. Yeah. Which is why yeah. like, you know, my family, we visited San Francisco when I was in middle school. I'm originally from Georgia. Um, all my family is still back in the deep South. I say deep South because people out here say, yeah, I'm from the South. I'm from LA. And you know, we say, what is that? Lower, lower Alabama? <laughs> right. right. No, it's Los Angeles. It's like, oh, no, you're not from the South. You're from SoCal. Giant distinction. So um, being from the, the South South, the real right. South, yeah. um, where my whole family is still like, you know, we came out here when I was in middle school and I just was really drawn to just like the totally different type of culture that was out here on the West Coast, and but specifically San Francisco. And I always felt that this was a very welcoming um, community out here. Uh, all different types of things have happened out here, good and bad, obviously. Like, for instance, like I, you know, I'm positioned in between like the Grateful Dead house is not too far from here, but then on the other side is where Charles Manson lives. So you kind of have two ends of the sum of the spectrum, but also there's a lot of similarities between those two because they all were kind of interacting around the same time in 1967 because they lived just a few blocks from each other. Um, right. Same with Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix, Jefferson Airplane house is not too far. And then Anton LaVey also, um, just over in the other neighborhood, like over in the Richmond. So, um, and then- and the not to mention, over, Yeah, not, not to mention R. Crumb and some of R. the- R. Crumb, yeah, who, yeah, some of the, who some in the most, documentary claims he gets recognized the most, I believe in San Francisco when he was walking down yeah. like Market Street or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, um, the Beat Generation and, uh, of course, all that, you know, Ginsburg and, you know, right. Ginsburg hanging out with Sonny Barger. So, right, right, I mean, right. That's, yeah, that's yeah. nuts, right? The I mean, dichotomies are so strong in this city. 
um, because it was, you know, it, it, it has the wild side, has a very conservative side, it has a liberal side, it also has a ton of money. So it, it, the dichotomies in San Francisco are very, very fascinating that, I mean, that's been written about to death, but um, it right. is interesting as an artist who, who didn't grow up here, coming here and maybe mm -hmm. in finding these kind of pockets of dichotomy. Is right. Let me put it this way. So where I grew up and um, this last election really kind of opened my eyes to this, but like where I grew up, which is just north of Atlanta at the time of me growing up, which is a while back, it was known as one of the more conservative counties, definitely in Georgia, but also in the United States, according to the author, Peter Applebaum. And <clears throat> So I grew up like not too far from where Newt Gingrich lived when you speak of the house back in the 90s. So like, so very conservative um, county. This is Cobb County, Georgia. Um, I grew up in Cobb County, Georgia. And then I moved from there. I lived in downtown Atlanta for about eight or nine years and then moved out to San Francisco. But so I went from basically growing up in Cobb County to San Francisco. And now where I live, where my wife and, and, uh, and our daughter live is in, um, in San Francisco is the Haight-Ashbury, so, which is one of the more liberal neighborhoods in San Francisco. So, I mean, you really couldn't get opposite end of the spectrum. And, and kind of back to her, looping back around to your question about how living here has influenced me. It's like, I grew up like here, like from kind of like right-leaning and then ended up in like way left-leaning. Um, so I've kind of seen both ends of the spectrum, you know, from a political standpoint, but also just from just like a cultural standpoint you know, growing up in the suburbs and now being in a, in a pretty kind of dense city because um, right. we're all kind of stacked on top of each other here in San Francisco, yeah. you know, and, you know, people do drive in San Francisco. Like I've lived here for, you know, pushing 17 years and I didn't have a car until two months ago. Like I bought my wife a car. So, um, you know, and when I lived in Georgia and then in Atlanta, of course we had a car. So, you know, that's just, just one little, you know, example of the, of the difference there. But further, but more to your question, it's like, I've never seen like a motorcycle club before. Like I'd never seen a Hells Angels member until I moved to San Francisco. And it turns out, you know, there are clubhouses across the street from where I went to grad school, literally across the street. So right. I was like, yeah. whoa, you know, I'd never been to exp expose anything like that before. What, do you remember when, like maybe the mistakes that you might've made when you first started, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot. You first got into making quilts. Um, a mistake when you're doing a quilt is a big deal. Well, Correct? yeah, I mean it can be, but one 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 great thing that I found with with textiles is it can it can be forgiving. Uh, you're able to kind of just take a seam ripper and pull off the stitches, and, and a lot of times you can kind of budget per mm -hmm. se. But concerning mistakes, like. Uh, there's a ton of mistakes in, in all the work I even do to this day, but I think that's what makes it inherently handmade, right? Even though I am using a machine to stitch it, but they're, but they're all done by me, like as in I'm not having it uh, produced by, by, uh, by anything. Like I'm, I'm making it entirely myself. Um, literally in this space that you see behind me, like there is my, mach my machine that's the studio. right there. Yeah. Hmm. Um, that does everything there. So, um, yeah, like I'll cut something wrong or it won't, it might be sewn a little wrong, but you know, I, I like that, that element of, of the human touch to it and more specifically the artist touch. It's not, it can, with fabric, it can never be perfect, perfect, right? You know, it's never gonna be down to this, it's 16th of an inch because fabric stretches. And then after you sew it a bunch and then lay all these other, you know, fabrics onto it, it's going to, gonna push and pull especially when you kind of just run everything under the sun through the machine like me like elastic underwear denim leather uh you know t-shirt material like half cotton half polyester silk uh you know whatever else uh, waterproof fabric that has this kind of more plasticky you know this kind of like you know ripstop fabric that you know yeah. a backpack right. is made out of so that all interacts differently with each other and the machine treats a little bit differently too. Um, Cause this is actually the second machine I've had cause I literally blew my other one to complete shreds. So it blew the F up. I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what are, would you say the possibilities are endless in a quilt or is there limitations and that's what excites you is that you have to, you have to find a way to get from point A to point Z mm -hmm. 
with with a bit of limitations and that's where yeah. like mastery of the craft comes in or is it or or am i or am i off in that reading no i think that's a fair way to put it from my standpoint and i'm you know i i'd love to hear what other quilters would respond to this question as well but like for me i think yeah you're definitely working within um some loose boundary um as i was saying earlier all my work is technically a quilt so you know the top layer the batting and the bottom layer so i'm, I'm working within those boundaries already to make sure that when i make a when I'm doing a quilt that from the uh, definition of what a quilt is, it falls within that range, right? So that's right. one little boundary. But then also kind of like the slide we're looking at now, that's the largest quilt I made to date. And I don't think I could have shoved any more fabric than that through my machine and the one that I had purchased. So I'd have to buy an even bigger machine to shove all that fabric through the throat of the machine. Mm -hmm. So that was like a limitation there. Like, and that one barely fit through. I mean, that was, that one took me five months to make and it was like an epic nightmare. But, um, and kind of back to your other question about mistakes is like, you know, I had no idea if that was gonna be crooked or not until they hung it on the gallery wall. Right, right. Like, so there, literally, so you, don't, like, literally, you, don't, you don't know, you know the know. final result until you have to like take, it's not like you don't get the opportunity like a painter does where you're painting in the studio, you can take a step back, look at what right. you're doing. You kind of don't know what it looks like until the very last second. Is that, is that? Accurate for me, as well? for me, for me, that's a, a hundred percent accurate because my mm -hmm. studio is not that large. Like that quilt there was made um, like uh, at Guerrero Gallery at night. Like Andreas gave me the key to his gallery, and he was generous enough to let me use the gallery space when he, his gallery was in the mission. And I would come in at night and sweep the floor and lay it out in the gallery because um, he had a much bigger space than my apartment. And then even though I laid it all out at, at Guerrero Gallery, I still, I literally folded it up and put it in one of those giant Ikea bags and then rode my bike, bicycle back to my apartment and then sewed it at my apartment when I lived with uh, Kevin Taylor um, a couple of years ago when we lived in the mission. Um, and my, my, I literally sewed it in my bedroom, that, that quilt. That, that one was from 2011. Okay. So, uh, but my studio that, I'm in now is in the apartment that my wife and I live in. It's in the back room of our apartment. So the room, the room that, that I have my studio in is now is not any bigger than the room that I sewed that quilt in. So, you know, I, I, I like anything that's bigger than like, you know, three foot by four foot. I, I don't know what it looks like until it's at the gallery or, or until it's at a space that I can climb up a ladder and look at it because, you know, I, like, I do all the sewing in this room here, but my kitchen is is right through this door here. And when, when my wife is at work or when my daughter is napping, I, I push our kitchen table out of the way and use like the little, like the hard floor of the kitchen to kind of like do the, a lot of the ironing and, and laying things out. Then I just bring it back into this room to sew it. But I can right. kind of get up on the, I get up on the kitchen chair and kind of can look down and get a, like a little, little bit of a little bit of an idea yeah. but you know i also have a ruler and you know i i, I triple check it as best i can so i well, think i've been good so far but you know how do you how do you plan this so it's let's say you uh, a friend gave you a, a ramones patch an iron maiden patch you got some a carhartt jacket you got some mm -hmm. levi's and you're gonna make a quilt from these mm -hmm. materials that you're gathering what how how does that material that you get from people translate to the final product? Like, are you going like, okay, I've got all this denim. Um, I've got these patches and I'm going to make something based around the stuff I have. Or do you have an idea and go like, I need to go find those patches. Mm -hmm. I need to go find that denim. And I, and that's how you start. A little bit of all that. Uh, okay. Basically I, I have an idea. Like some, some pieces start, one way and others start the other way. So sometimes I go A to B, sometimes I go B to A, right? So for example, like uh, I have an idea of a design I want to do, and then I'll go through like my giant, you know, I got just got fabric laying all around here and on my table behind me. So I have my design and I'll go through all my fabric bins and find fabric that I think will fit good in that and whatever part of that design. And then I'll kind of build it from that. So the short answer is, I typically, when I work that way, I have the design and then I kind of look through my piles of fabric to find fabric that, that I think will go well with that design. 
And then the other way is, it's like, I want to do a quilt that's primarily made out of denim. So then I'll either put a call out for uh, used denim, or I, you know, I have a, a big pile of it already that I've amassed over the last couple of years. Then I'll go back and dig through that pile of all my denim. Because now, recently, I, my wife was like, you really need to clean up your studio because it's getting to be a total mess. Um, and, you know, it's time to kind of do some spring cleaning. So I, you know, kind of reorganize things a little bit more. So now I have like one bin is all like used leather jackets. The other one's like used denim. And then the other one's like all different types of like different scraps that I've, that I've had over the years. So I, I've gotten a little bit more organized um, more recently. But so again, it kind of can go both ways. Okay. But typically, I think the short answer is I typically have an idea and then kind of work from there. Okay. Um, I, and thank you, people, um, for uh, for asking questions. We'll get to those in a second. Um, that are actually really good questions. Um, I uh, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this or word this because you'll have a better idea and you'll and you'll do it for me. Um, do quilt artists talk to each other? Do you have a community <laughs> of people that you talk to? Are there uh, perhaps people who work in the quilt and textile fiber arts craft? who have positive things to say about what you're doing? Are there people that fight back on some of the, maybe the, the kind of the new imagery and some of the new um, sort of subversive cultures that you're bringing to the forefront to the craft? Like mm -hmm. how do, have those discussions gone over, I would say the last, I mean, since you started and started getting yeah. recognition for your work. So that was like, what, like a five part question? Um, <laughs> there was a lot there and I apologize, but I'm trying to- uh, uh, Yes, 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 no. All right, done. <laughs> um, yes, uh, quilters talk to each other. Um, okay. Absolutely. Uh, pretty much like the talk shop. Uh, is That's been my experience. Um, yes, I apologize. I, I, I lumped you all together. That was that was not. Oh, I, no, I, not at all. I, mean. I think totally it was fine. more of an age, an age thing, and a generational thing. Like, are are you getting feedback from people who've worked in this these mediums for for decades, and mm -hmm. what are they thinking about the stuff that you're doing? Yeah, yeah. So I, I I'll go through your your five part question, Evan. <laughs> so then, like, yes, the, and then as far as like the quilting community giving feedback or you know, positive, negative. Yes, I've absolutely gotten both. Uh, I was teaching, I've taught a, a couple classes at Aramont, which is like in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And coincidentally, uh, one of my students, um, she took my class twice. She was trained as like, she's like a professional quilter. And she mm -hmm. took my class the first time. And, you know, she's um, a woman that's, I think she's, uh, she's a little bit older. She's like probably around like a little older than, than, than my mom. And she's been making quilts for a long time and she's super talented quilter. And she was a little, she was aware of who I was and that's why she took the class. But, and we, you know, we were talking shop and she enters her quilts in all these uh, contests, these quilt contests. And, and I was like, and so I asked her like one day, I was like, what do you think about, you think, <laughs> What do you think about me entering these contests? And she, yeah, yeah. And she, she straight up was like, no, you'll totally get disqualified. And I was like, wow. okay. I was like, why, why, you know? She's like, because you're not making it to their specifications. And, oh. and I was like, oh, okay. You know, that's, I, you know, I'd never heard that before. And I was like, that's like, that's like the honest answer that you want. Like, she's like, no. And, and so, and, and so she's kind of running down the line of why I would never be accepted into those competitions. And, and, and the, basically the reason why is like how I construct it. You know, there's certain, there's very specific ways of how you go about making the, making the quilt, um, not just the size or anything like that, but how you stitch it, how you do the binding, how you do, you know, like, I don't, like, even if it's applique, there's all these different cat subcategories for the, for okay. the competition. Like, you know, there's like the crazy quilting and, and then there's like the, you know, log cabin quilting and like, where would mine fit into? And she's like, yeah, I wouldn't really fit into anything. And I was like, <laughs> that's I was honest. Like, I was like, thanks. Even, so. thanks, thanks for your honesty. Um, but she's great. We still we still um, email uh, periodically today. Um, so that was really good to hear. And and then uh, you know I have I have given lectures at a couple of quilt guilds all around, mm -hmm. and those are basically yeah. just communities 
of uh, people that get together that really primarily only talk about like quilting. And those, you know, I've given lectures to all in all different types of uh, settings, you know, gallery settings, uh, museum settings, um, primarily uh, university settings. But I will, I will say that the most entertaining uh, lectures I've ever given have been at quilt guilds because it's a totally different environment. And um, the, one of the more lively lectures I gave was at the San Francisco Quilt Guild, coincidentally, um, out over in the outer Richmond a couple of years ago. And okay. during, during the lecture, people are literally interrupting me and saying, and like correcting me or saying that's wrong or like, you know, heavy metal is not music or like Metallica is evil, oh. you know? And so it was, it was pretty right. hilarious. I mean, they're okay. all very, res you know, respectful. Yeah, right, right. For the most part, but um, you know, it, it was it was really it was really good fun, and did that I think that that was that your did I answer all like four? That was no, that was great. No, I mean, I I wanted to know more about your, your relationship with such a you know it's it, it's such a in some ways it's an antiquated art form, but mm -hmm. there's been so much resurgence of energy put into it yeah. in the last couple of decades that I was curious if if you felt any sort of pushback but you know i guess it no to yeah that. definitely we'll go, yeah go ahead i think there's definitely been some pushback because yeah. you know the type of imagery that i'm using is is what i would categorize as like rather aggressive right i mean punk rock and heavy right. metal and skateboarding are a lot of things but one thing they aren't are like just in 1000 percent safe right? right there's a lot of right. like you know loudness, uh, aggressiveness, you know, there's a lot of activity in all right. that, uh, danger, you know, within skateboarding, et cetera. And, and, and those are things that, that are in, of interest to me. They're exciting, right? It's not, it's not just, uh, you know, safe and pretty all the time. Do you think, I mean, and there, we me. have so many, we have so many questions, which is so cool. This is, it's awesome. Um, what is to you what is what what is rebellion in art to you rebellion is it and in art yeah like is it is it breaking rules is it um challenging the status quo is it or is it um working within the confines of the craft and and in, in, in finding experimental kind of elements within that i think rebellion in art for me is just is basically doing what you want to do and then and just and and staying true to that as best that you can i keep thinking back um to this patty smith quote that had been recirculating again recently and and she was basically saying and you know the quote's been around for a while i don't know when she actually you know said it but it kind of had a resurgence in the last few months um at least online and and i'll butcher the quote because it's like a long quote but she's basically saying, you know, you have your name is your brand, and that's your that's your currency, right? So, uh, when you have that mentality, when you decide on to do things or not to do things, and and what you're doing, like, you know, that's that's your true value, and 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 what you're doing is your name. So, like, the way you the way you move through the world, the way you move through the art world, the way you move through the music industry, et cetera, keep that in mind. That that's your you know, don't let anyone. Uh, damage that by trying to like co-opt it or trying to like point it in, in the wrong direction just you know do do what you want to do trade stay true to yourself and and don't don't worry about being successful or, or making a lot of money it's mainly about doing what you want to do uh, as much of, of the time as you can so my goal is always try to be try to stay true to that try to be able to do what I want to do most of the time um, and as far as like rebellion aspect of, of it, I don't really necessarily think of it as that stamp from that kind of viewpoint. I'm more thinking about doing things that of, are of direct interest to me. And, right. and, I, and then also attempting to share that with other people who may or may not be of a similar mindset. If they're not, that's totally fine. Let's have a conversation about that. If they are, let's have a conversation about that also, right? Um, so... Yeah, as as right before we get to the, all the um, people watching and the, their questions, um, you're in the show at the Crystal Bridges Museum, mm -hmm. uh, a beautiful museum. I I've, I was lucky enough to go a couple of years ago, um, and the show is Crafting America, 
And, you know, you're, you're, you have your work hanging alongside, you know, Ruth Asawa, Nick Cave. I mean, these names are just, you know, they're yeah, just it's such crazy. It's crazy, crazy, right? Awesome. I mean, like, like legends, you know, living legends and, and, and legends who are no longer with us. Um, how, it's, it must be cool to be embraced by, by this kind of movement. And, but it's also like what you're, you're, you know, you're still a young man and you get to kind of see this kind of career take off. You're, you're living it, you're in it. Um, how does it feel to be part of like this particular show and um, getting recognized on an institutional level in general? Mm -hmm. It's a huge honor. Uh, this show, when they initially reached out, I, you know, I, I knew of some of the other artists that were going to participate in the show and I was totally blown away by giving the opportunity to present my work alongside uh, all these amazing other great artists and so it was kind of like an absolute yes for me and it's weird how the world works sometimes is that and I don't know if uh, the curator the two curators of Crafting America are, are aware of this but um, the Crystal Bridges Museum approached me a couple years back it's probably like five or six years now when they are doing like another exhibition that when they are going around the entire United States and doing like, I think over a hundred some odd studio visits with artists to, to create this really large show about where, where art in America was at this specific time. And, you know, I was lucky enough to, to be, to have a studio visit from the curator and um, the director of the museum at the time. They actually, we actually did the uh, studio visit in my kitchen, <laughs> but, um, and I, I ultimately did my work. I did not get into that exhibition, but uh, a bunch of, a couple of friends of mine did, like a former teacher of mine did. And one of my good friends, uh, Laurel, Laurel Roth was in the show and it was great. I was, that's when, that was kind of the first introduction for me, real introduction for me about learning about the Crystal Bridges Museum. Cause I thought that was a really interesting show. Again, knowing, knowing people personally that are in that show. And I was like, oh, that, you know, that would have been cool to have been in it, but it wasn't meant to be, you know, fast forward five, six years later, and things have come full circle. And now my work is, is actually hanging in, in that museum. So it's even, it's kind of like a double honor for me. It's, I, I was just really, really um, excited to be part of the exhibition. And again, like, you know, a huge thanks for including my work. Um, you know, I, I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity. So we're gonna take some questions because there's some great questions here. Um, I, I This is a great one because I had it here too, but I didn't get a chance to get to it. So this person is definitely a, a bright person who's thinking the same lines I am. Uh, it's from an anonymous. It's <laughs> the, um, You're smart. Are, are quilts for the wall or for the bed? Oh, the, the age old question, right? It is the age old question. It's a great one. Yeah, it is a good one. So for me, I say both because Again, we going back to how I describe my work is this idea of like art and functionality. Um, I describe my art as in one word, my art is a collision. It's a collision between fine art craft and what I call the fringes of society. And that what that refers to is like punk rock, heavy metal, skateboarding, et cetera. And taking all these kind of disparate elements and colliding them in the form of a functional piece of artwork, typically a quilt. So if you were to purchase my work, you can either hang it on the wall much like a tapestry, so it kind of floats off the wall, or you can actually use it because going back to the technical aspects of what makes a quilt, mine are actually technically quilts. So yeah. it does have a functional aspect to it. It will keep you warm. So, you know, when, you know, when it gets cold outside and you don't have heat, you could potentially, you know, use this as a form of warmth. So rip it off the wall and, and use it. And I have, I do know of, of a couple of people that do, they don't use it like on a day-to-day -day basis per se, but I do know of at least one collector who, it was a medium-sized quilt and her and her husband took it out of the frame because it was framed and then used it as kind of like, um, not like a duvet covering, but kind of like, they kind of like laid it over their couch when they had okay. like um, right. parties or something, you know? And I, th I thought that was really, I thought that was really great. Because like it's getting that. used, it's totally different. Yeah, culture, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And that kind of, I don't want to give a super long answer to this, but that's a really good, this, this was a good question. So I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more, but it kind of more speaks to like how I think about my work and how I present the work and the way you present it 
is really dictated by the environment it's presented in, right? So if you have an opportunity at a museum, more often than not, it'll be hung on the wall, right? Like a tapestry, but then sometimes it could be presented in a totally different context. Like if it's presented in like, you know, a, um, like a, like a warehouse space, which I, which I was a part of a group show that was curated in Atlanta last year in this like really vast warehouse space. And I kind of hung it from the ceiling so you could kind of walk around and see both sides of it. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Or you could like fold it up and put it like on a pedestal. So it, it has all different types of uh, possibilities. And that's a, another thing that is, is of great interest, is continued interest for me uh, about textiles. So hopefully that answered that person's question because that was a very good question. That's a great thank, question. Thank you. Also, thank you. The, 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 cult, the cultures that you come from are, are not delicate cultures. Um, right, right, right. Punk rock, skateboarding, and and heavy metal are not. They're mm -hmm. they're, they're lived in. You know, there's blood. You know, there's blood, sweat, and it's it's not. Totally. It would. It, there's something about that that I think connects all this. Um, Rebecca here uh, asks the question: What made you decide that quilting was your medium? So, what I decided quilting was my primary medium because it was it was a medium that allowed me to do uh, fuse everything that I was interested in and I'm still interested in this idea of like concept and functionality, basically art and functionality fused together. And it was a perfect pairing for me because at this point now, I've kind of been doing a lot more uh, jackets, like custom made jackets. So another aspect for me that I've, that I've been doing in the last, just in the last few years is, is this idea of collaboration. So like a lot of the like fully customized jackets that I do are collaborations with different artists. And then like, I just, I've made two different like tote bags or handbags. Those, both of those were collaborations with the artist, Megan McClevey. And so again, like textiles has allowed me to branch out even more because for all these years, I've done all the work entirely myself, but now I've started, you know, more. And just in the last like two, three years, I started to do these, there's the tote bag that I've started to do these uh, collaborations with different artists out. This one was done with uh, Megan McClevey. Uh, I think it's called Thrashin, you know, Josh Brolin skateboard movie, bro. Um, daggers. <laughs> right, you know what I'm talking about. I had it on VHS anyhow, yeah. but, um, and I really liked, that's just another aspect of the textile medium that's allowed me to kind of branch out of my little comfort zone is collaboration. That's another one. This jacket is a collaboration with Tool. He's based in LA. He's, he's a chain stitcher. Him and I have collaborated on these. These jackets are 100% made from scratch. They're made from like a Letterman jacket pattern, like much, all, much like how you'd make a suit. Uh, so, and that's something totally new for me. Um, this, this one here I did, I bought a West Ham United uh, football jersey, football as in soccer, because it's English. Um, I'm a huge uh, English Premier League fan. Uh, Manchester City, which you should like, because uh, Evan likes Oasis. <laughs> you know it. You <laughs> They're know big it. Manchester City, City fans, man. You know, like yep, you know it. Supernova. Yeah. Uh, that's maybe they'll do a Manchester City Oasis tour. Um, this this jacket here was Aston. Villa slash Black Sabbath because Geezer Butler of Black Sabbath is a huge Aston Villa fan because they're from Aston, Birmingham. Um, so that was kind of a long answer to that question. That, that well, this, this is, is another this, collaboration. This is good too, because there's another question here from an anon anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, what changes about your work when someone wears it? Yeah, um, I would say not much, hopefully. Hopefully it doesn't get completely destroyed, but I think it just, it gets a little bit of wear and tear, but that's totally fine because a lot of the material was already worn. So again, this idea of like, it's really come double full circle now, right? So it was made, the initial item was made from recycled materials, then it gets, then it gets worn again. Now it's like totally has a, a like a third life even, or maybe yeah. even a fourth life. And I like that reuse, reuse, reuse. That, that I find really interesting, right? Because it just uh, keeps coming back around. I, I, you know, this is this is a great question. Uh, Stacy Owen writes, "Do you ever experience writer's block? I mean, artist block, like writer's block. 
if mm -hmm. yes, um, what do you do to get out of it? And I was thinking, we didn't even bring this up, but we're living in extraordinary times, the pandemic, uh, you know, March of last year, all of a sudden you're like, Whoa, okay, maybe you've got scheduling things that are now over and have changed and rescheduled. And a lot of artists had different responses. And I'm wondering, and it's a great question because it, it ties into maybe even the last year that we've all been living yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. How do you deal with artist block? So that's a good question. And I'll answer that with what one of my, uh, teachers from grad school, uh, Paul Koss, who um, amazing artist, and he, I remember telling me one time that he went through a two-year period in his career. He's like, I just didn't have anything to say, and he he was like, I you know, I wasn't worried about it. I knew it would come eventually, but that's just that's just part of it. And you know, I listened to a lot of podcasts, and I would tell this person, um, is it Stacy who asked this question, or yes, whoever, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Stacy, go and listen to TED Talks. TED Talks are great. T-E-D. Uh, -E um, it's an acronym. And you can listen to them. You could probably get them on iTunes. But there's one that's about, like, that's on, on creativity. And that one's really interesting. It talks about the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And then, and then Tom Waits is on it. And it's all about creativity. And it's about, like, you know, when you're driving in traffic in LA and a song comes in your head, you're like, no, 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 no. I'm not ready yet. Can't you see I'm in traffic? Leave me alone until I get into the freaking studio, you know? So right. everyone goes through this. And, and for me, you know, it's about uh, just continually working. And I'll, I'll quote another teacher of mine uh, from school. And he, he was saying um, that basically it's like, you know, making art is, he always liked to compare it to playing a sport and then, you know, to, to keep up, he, he liked baseball. So um he was always comparing things to baseball and he would, he would say like, you know, you got to get your batting practice in, you got to get your fielding practice in. Right. So you gotta, you gotta put the time in the studio and that kind of helps you work with, keep working, keep working, keep working. So even mm -hmm. if you're in your studio, just sitting and staring at the wall or just doodling in the sketchbook, that still counts. And that helps you kind of get out of that rut eventually, but more towards this last year. Yeah. Everything got put on hold. Um, all, all, all these exhibitions got pushed back and or canceled for, for me and a lot of other people I know. Uh, and, and pretty much by, I think by late March, early April, uh, for me, I just was like, well, I don't know what to do. And there's all these calls about like people needing like face masks. So I just stopped everything and just started making face masks, like cloth face masks since I had yeah. a sewing machine. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I made a couple hundred of them. I know other artists that made like, uh, like close to a thousand. Um, unfortunately, I was only able to make a couple hundred. Um, I'm, I'm just not as fast as, as they were, I guess. But um, I, I did what I could and I, I, I donated all of them. I, you know, I mailed them to all, all over the United States, including, you know, a handful went to Germany. I will, I will say I did sell a few of them through the Museum of Craft and Design here in San Francisco because they wanted just a few to, to coincide with a motorcycle exhibition that they had. So I did some Harley Davidson ones and oh, he sold cool. those for like, I think maybe like 30 bucks. And that was kind of like to kind of help with that exhibition. But um, all example. the other ones, like the, um, the gentleman staring, standing in the middle there is an ER doctor. His name is Darren Williams and he works in Georgia. He just actually just moved to Charleston, South Carolina, but he was literally on the front lines and he's a long time family friend. His mom is one of my mom's best friends. And he, he literally texted me one day. He's like, man, we need face masks. We need, and we need to put them over our N95s because they, they extend the life of the N95. So all these doctors are wearing N95 masks with the cloth mask that I sent them over it. Oh, cool. And so, um, so that was kind of a way for me to kind of like, you know, do something, you know, that's functional and it's actually, being used in like a real world way. Like I made all my family and friends masks. Like I sent them immediately to my, my sister and her husband and their two kids, my parents, you know, obviously my wife and my daughter, et cetera. So that's kind of how I got through the first couple of months of the pandemic. And that's cool, Ben, because it, it speaks to the functionality too of, 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 of what you do and that there is, mm -hmm. there is this functional um, aspect to it. And it, it, it gets, um, highlighted in, in kind of in this way as we're seeing in this way. Um, 
Do you know, this is a question from Elizabeth Bray. Elizabeth wants to know if you know the Modern Quilt Guild. The Modern Quilt Guild? Um, there's a lot of quilt. M-U-G. M-U-G. I don't know. There's a lot of quilt guilds. If you, if I knew where it was based, um, I guess, I guess the short answer would be no. I don't, I will look it up though. Modern quilt guild. I'll definitely look it up. I know there's all different types of quilt guilds and they all kind of like the ones I'm aware of kind of have like pretty general names. So it's kind of like hard to distinguish a few of them, but I, I, I will look up the modern quilt guild for sure. Um, thank you for that question. This is a funny. This is a funny uh, observation from from uh, the viewer Sally, who said, "Just just say it like your relationship with old lady quilters," because um, I was sort of skirting around that terminology mm-hmm. a little bit. But what yeah. in that question is very fascinating because it is an art form that at times is associated with her words, old lady quilters. Yeah. So. Um, Talk, maybe talk a little, you can maybe speak a little bit to the, uh, maybe a little bit of a, a, a gender question. And is it, does it surprise people that um, there's maybe not as many men doing quilts? Is that even true? Like maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my grandmother, which I, we call my Nana, um, she's passed away, but she made quilts. And I actually have one of her quilts here behind me that's, that I'm going to finish off. And, uh, you know, my sister was a quilter too. So, you could argue I come from uh, a family of quilters, but more to the, um, and I'll use this person's uh, terminology, old lady quilters. I, I you know, um, since that was her question, that like, yeah, like um, I, I've spoken to a lot of them, like, you know, when I give lectures at the quilt guilds or just through, a, through email. And yeah, I, I get, there's definitely some negative feedback and there's definitely some positive feedback, but what I'd ultimately say about like concerning like the gender uh, question. Yeah. Yes, I am a male that makes quilts, but for me, it was, I come at it not trying to take away from, from anyone else or the history of quilt making um, or any of the women, the amazing women who have made quilts um, over the years. And especially to this day, I'm not trying to take a take away from anything from them at all. Uh, For me, I make quilts because it was something that I found personally extremely interesting, and I wanted I wanted to kind of put my own style to it, my own spin on it, and say my own, and and it was a good medium for for me to express my own voice through. Um, again, this idea of like functionality and art being fused together. But anytime I talk about my work, I I try to make a point that the literally the primary inspiration for all the work that I do is directly responsible from the quilters of G's Bend. Me being from Georgia, then being from Alabama. And it was an exhibition that I saw coincidentally out here in at the DeYoung Museum in 2006. That's when the, the show, the G's Bend quilt show had traveled through San Francisco it was back in 2006. And since then I saw that those, the work in that show by those women. And I, and I just thought it was like the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And it just really, really spoke to me. And then I didn't make my first quilt until, until two years later. And so that, that has always been a direct inspiration for me. Uh, and I always try to make a point to kind of give a thousand percent credit to them because that's, that's what I'm looking at for what I'm doing now. And that's kind of what um, brought me to where I am today, like a thousand and ten percent. And now, and now you have someone like uh, Bisa Butler, who's been doing amazing work, and um, her and I have communicated uh, uh, periodically via, via like online, and a giant, giant, giant fan of her work. Yeah, she um, she we had her on the cover of Juxtapose a couple of, a couple of issues ago, and uh, what she's doing with what appears to be portrait painting with quilts is just fantastic. Um, hey, there we go. Good play. Elizabeth and Sally said the Modern Quilt Guild is an international, um, it's international with local guilds all over the world and they would welcome you at their shows. Oh, well, thank you. I will definitely look into it. I've I had some, some interaction with a, like an Irish quilt guild. And then there was another one um, that I thought might've been a, a part of the Modern Art Quilt Guild, but maybe it was like a sub sect that was in England. So uh, I will definitely look into that. And yeah, I, I am aware of a lot of these quilt competitions, um, mainly 
from the professional quilter who told me I wouldn't, um, how my work wouldn't be accepted <laughs> into the competition. <laughs> uh, she's she's probably is, watching this. Hi, Pat. She I is love not you. happy with you. Oh, um, no, no, she's great. She actually taught oh, she, me a lot. Okay. Oh, no, she's, so, okay, good. Shout out um, to Pat. Shout out to Pat. That's right. You did mention that in the talk that she was. Um, we're nearing the end, but I like this question. I, I would like to get this answered. Um, Pat asks, um, how many heavy duty machine needles do you go through in a year? And do you ever use any few, any fusible in your work? Uh, I, I don't know how many needles I go through. I blow through them though. Cause I'm just running whatever the hell yeah. through the machine. So I use all different types of needles, like leather ones, the kind of the Jersey ones, the denim ones. And then like kind of the, um, the real sharper ones. Uh, I would show you that it's like just out of reach. And then as far as fusible, I use um, 505 fabric spray. And this kind of goes back to when I, like when we first started the conversation, Evan, and about like mistakes. And so, you know, I bought that book, Quilting Basics 101, but more importantly, anytime I went to the fabric store or anytime I ran into another person who knew how to quilt or knew more about sewing, I would just ask a lot of questions. And that's kind of, that's really where I kind of learned um, tricks of the trade, so to speak. And one of those was from my friend, Heidi, one day she's like, oh, you should totally use this fabric spray, 505 fabric spray. It's like basting spray, which means you don't, it kind of speeds up the process where I'm not having to like pin things down. It's kind of yeah. like an acid-free spray that you spray on the back of the fabric then plop it down when you do applique. It's literally, it cuts the time in half so much. And it's like, you know, I use a lot of that. So uh, yes, I do use um, basting spray, uh, specifically like, specifically 505 because I don't want to uh, iron it I don't I try to make it quick that was I like that that was good um and then I guess I, I don't really know how much more time we have left but uh how do you sign your work and do you sign your work I don't really sign it yeah the fabrics I don't sign anything uh when we did when I the only stuff that's signed is when we do the collaborations and okay. like Megan Megan McClevy will do like a label inside the tote bags and then um Tool, Tool will do, uh, like he'll chain stitch our names on the inside of the lining, like on the back part of the jacket. So let's say like Ben Venom and- And then you, you signed stuff when we, did, tool when tool. we did the Vans pop-up, you signed some of the patches and then put them on people's jackets, didn't you? Yeah, because they asked, because they yeah. asked for that. Yeah, that's um, right. That's like, if, they, if someone asked, yeah, I, I definitely will. But that has come up in the past, like, you know, maybe you should sign stuff, but like, uh, you know, I kind of went, when you went back to ask, like, what, what's a way to, what makes my work, my work. And like, you know, I'm of the opinion that most people would be able to tell that it's mine. Right. So, you know, why, why yeah. sign it? Furthermore, I've, you know, I've so, run so over. So far, so original. I mean, like you've, you've kind of got, you, you've got your look. So, I mean, it's definitely, I, I, I would hope so, uh, you know, I would hope thing. so, but like, at least that's, that's my goal to, right but yeah. more specifically like you know i have sewn over my finger a couple of times and so my blood is literally on a couple of those quilts so that's I, it happens it hurts you know i'm Whatever. surprised it doesn't happen more often though does that not don't happen say, like... don't say that i'm gonna end up like it hurts like hell man yeah yeah i can imagine yeah uh, totally totally uh yeah i don't We've kind of, I've kind of went through all the questions and everything. Um, you want to do one more quick one or we got like maybe one minute left? Let's see what we got. Um, if I can find any more. How do you sign your work? What do you put on the backs? Oh, interesting question. Usually just like a, a, a solid piece of fabric typically, but then more recently I started to kind of put a, uh, fabric that had like different designs on it because yeah. sometimes you know either the person that you know if it's hanging in a gallery or museum more often than not you won't be able to see the back especially if it's at a museum because no one's gonna allow you to touch it right at a gallery you might be able to get away with kind of pulling it up and looking on the back but um kind of going back to the mistake aspect uh <laughs> this is like totally giving myself away you can tell if I mess something up, if you look on the back and there's like, you can see some of the stitching, like, oh, he totally messed that part up and I had to go back after it was already finished and redo that part. Yeah, so if you wanna see my mistakes, 
you, you'll, you can see some of them on the back. Cause I actually had to like fix it after I'd already quilted it. And I was like, Oh, you know, Oh snap. Like I forgot to do this part here or, you know, and so I, I can, I can still fix it even though it's finished and that, but that stitch will go through all the three layers and you'll be able to see it on the back. Ben, just, just for context for people. Yeah. Uh, like a work like this, how, this how, how heavy, how heavy would that be? This one right here was a little heavy because it's made from like used car art and, and, um, yeah, and yeah, denim. Yeah. And then the outside border that it's all Navy. Those are all Dicky pants. Those are actually all from, uh, my good buddy, Randy Dotson, his wife made him clean out his, his, uh, dr uh, dresser drawer one day. And he had a bunch of like Dicky pants. He's like, you need to like get rid of these. And so he gave them to me in a giant bag and he claims to have washed them, but I think he lied. And so m my wife, Megan was like, you need to st just wash them to check. So I had, I washed them again, but those are all like his pants. <laughs> um, and then all used car art and all used like, um, denim pants in there. So that one, like, that one's like a decent size. It's like around the six foot by six foot range, like probably five mm -hmm. foot by six foot. I mean, weight wise, I don't know, like, I don't know, 10, 10 pounds, maybe it's hard to tell. Yeah. Cause it like pulls down, you know, right. Yeah, right. But, um, not super heavy. That other one, yeah. the really long one was kind of heavy. That was on the, on the wall there. This is, a, these were all at the Fort Wayne museum, um, just a few right. years ago with a show that was with, um, uh, with Lucian and, and, and Ravi. Right. Um, that, was, that Joseph did. Somebody, yeah. That, that one's a little bit bigger. It's like seven, a, by yeah. thir seven feet by 13 feet. I think so that one's a little heavier. That one's not, not super heavy, you know, not super, super heavy. Yeah. Have you um, been able to, well, I, I think this is a question I wanted to ask. Um, yeah. Have you been able to meet some heroes through this kind of journey that you've been on? Yeah, like uh, coincidentally, I, I met Josh at the Super Flat show that you and Takashi did. Remember, he rolled in Josh, totally, Josh totally, totally by, yeah, yeah, totally by accident. Accident, and my wife. He was just uh, walking by. He was just was, walking by, which is nuts. Awesome. Yeah. Super nice guy. He's only okay. like six foot five, He's and huge. you know, like I'm like five seven on a good day. His eleven year old daughter was like my height, which was like okay. Yeah, yeah. But um, he was super nice, and you, I think you met him too, right? You got the, a chance to chat with him real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, emails after and everything too. Yeah. Yeah, and like he recently contacted me, so I did a piece for him for his Desert Sessions uh, project just about a year ago, within the last year and a half. Um, I talked to him on the phone a, a, a couple times, and um, it was super cool because, you know, again, like my, you know, my wife is a bitch, big Caius fan, as I, as am I, and. Queens in the Stone, Stone Age, Eagles of Death Metal. That was super awesome to meet him. But, and then I've also, you know, I'm from Atlanta, always been a, from early stages, giant Macedon fan. And recently I, I made a jacket for Braun, uh, the drummer in Macedon. Um, I made him a, him a custom jacket. Tool and I made him a custom jacket from his, um, from t-shirts he had had since he was a teenager. So that was, you know, that's something that's like directly, from from him t-shirts he wore when he was like you know late teens and that's again that's such an interesting thing about the, the textile medium right is like you know he is now gets to wear a jacket that with all these memories from when he wore those t-shirts and now they're cut up and made into a jacket like all as one so it's all of like his like crazy memories and you know he shared some you know one in particular very personal memory for that he had and, and this randy rhodes t-shirt that he wore <laughs> You know, and so that was that was pretty cool to meet him. But actually, I've never I've never met him in person. We've talked. We've uh, only communicated like via phone. But mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, next time I'm in Atlanta or he's out here, we you know we plan to meet up. And he, like I'm trying to think of else. Uh, Laura Laura Pleasance of Kylesa, we've we've met uh, a couple times in person, and I actually just sent her some patches, and she just sent me. A big box of stuff that's down here. Um, she's donated a lot of t-shirts over the years uh, to my work. Um, big fan of, of her music. She's in a new band now called the, uh, I believe it's called The Discussion. Um, and then 
there's a there's a couple other people too like dudes from valiant thor are awesome you know i'm i'm a big music fan so it's great to meet people within music but then more from like art world stuff like you know meeting uh you know cleon uh cleon peterson a big big cleon fan spoke to him on the phone actually coincidentally just the other day and uh trying to think of who else i don't want to just name drop that's kind of lame no 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 i just you know i was curious like where where the journey is taking you and it's it's kind of cool that there's there's people outside of um just the the realm of the fine art world paying attention to what you're doing i think it's always really cool yeah like it's 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 crazy like life can be crazy and weird sometimes with the people you run into you know like it's it's totally random sometimes and that's kind of what makes things interesting it's just you know always trying to put yourself out there as best you can in a positive light and then and you know accept everything that comes back you know positive and negative and and try to keep moving forward so you know keep pushing i can hear my daughter now (laughs) (laughs) um well Ben, thank you so much for your time. This is some super fun. I mean, it's just nice to we live we live about eight miles from each other, and it's, it, feels, it feels like I, a, a completely different universe. So, yeah, I haven't. I don't think I've seen you in person in a while. So, I know. Um, I hope our paths cross soon. And uh, I do too. Thank you for your time, Evan. And and again, uh, many Love many it. thanks to Crystal Bridges Museum for for uh, hosting us and letting us chat about stuff. So. Um, Thank yeah, you. it's an honor, really was.